Um, Tarek, I'm really glad that you've taken some time to talk to Cultural Attaché. And before we talk about the quickening, I want to talk to you about Rayfon Williams, because oh. you're, you're sharing the program at Pacific Corral with a work by Rayfon Williams, and it happens to be the 150th anniversary of, of his birth. And I'm wondering what thoughts you have about Von Williams' music and if he as a composer has influenced you in any way. That's really interesting. Um, I've, I think I, over the years, I've had a, 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 re, a reckoning, I suppose, with um, Vaughan Williams. And I, I, used to, I used to hate it. <laughs> I used to hate his music. I thought it was interminable. Um, you know, just long, modal, endless stuff that... Um, I couldn't bring myself to listen to. And um, I sort of hated all the, the sort of jingoism, the sort of British, Britishness about it and sort of weaving in these folk melodies, some real, some made up. And, you know, things like the London Symphony, the, 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 as far as I could see, ripped off DBC and things like that. And it had nothing to do with, with London at all. But, Having said that, <laughs> um, over the, I think many people actually have had have had this feeling. Um, you know, over the years, I've come to actually see his trajectory as a composer um, very differently. And I think what I think what what's interesting about um, Vaughan Williams is that he's, you know, he develops over time. And I think he's created the one thing, you know, that in a way is always the easiest thing to dismiss, which is he's created an identifiable sound. Uh, you can always tell, pretty much, you can always tell a Vaughan Williams work through his, to my mind, uh, orchestration and the way that he handles these, you know, modal, modal harmonies particularly. Um, and I think, you know, as, as I've become a composer, I've realized that that's actually quite important. Because, you know, Vaughan Williams is one of those people that you could always sort of take the mickey out of. I'll, hear, I'll, I'll play Happy Birthday in the style of Vaughan Williams. And, you know, you, you know, what, if you're doing that, then you must be emulating something uh, which is, you must be able to copy something that's emulated. In other words, there must be some voice there um, that, that you're creating. So, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I remember what, I watched Scott of the Antarctic and had a sort of reawakening to, to his music uh, through that film and then re-listening re to the symphonies, even going back to the, to the London Symphony that, um, you know, used to sort of, I always used to think it's very twee. Um, but I, I think part of it is a sort of, you know, a sort of, reckoning in my mind about what it means to be a composer with a unique voice and also thinking about Vaughan Williams's time in from actually from having lived in the States for so long which is sort of from a Copeland perspective in a way which is how how do you how do you create a, a sort of sound identified with you know your own heritage and the nation in which you live that that is somehow different to, you know, the dominant um, sort of Eurocentric movements of that time, um, namely out of Germany, you know, sort of a, a very strong Germanic romantic, late romantic tradition. Um, and you just have to give, you know, you just have to give him credit really for, uh, we're quick to judge these days, which is he had a go. You know, he influenced a lot of people. I mean, that's the other thing. He's, he's become, so yeah, those two sides of it. I think, yeah, you know, what how to go and create, um, you know, has made me really re rethink of it, rethink his out his output. Right. So I'll just I'll just restate that question for you. You know, sure. on on the press materials on the website, the quickening is described as a choral fanfare, which is apart from John Rutter, not a term that I commonly find used. And I'm wondering if you feel that that is an apt description or if that is exactly what you intended to write it's it's what we intended to write um and it 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 was there right at the very beginning when we started discussing 
this um, piece, uh, uh, which is the third commission for the Pacific Corral as part of my um, residency there. And um, this sort of came about, or thinking about this came about at the height of the pandemic when it was at its worst. And it was always really about bringing the full forces of the Pacific Choral Pacific Symphony together um, after this sort of two year hiatus. Um, and so it was always, and that's, you know, so right from the beginning, it was meant to be a sort of celebratory opening to the largest forces being together on stage and making uh, music again. So yeah, it's for large, it's for a large chorus and it's for a large orchestra, um, more or less matching the the Vaughan Williams. So yeah, and it, and it and so the fanfare aspect of it is um a sort of opening um and a welcoming, I suppose, um both to the performers, but also to the audience and the community there. Um, and it's it's interesting because I mean fanfares in general, I suppose, have a sort of um celebratory uh aspect to them embedded in the word fanfare. Um and there's certainly that in there, but I mean when when um we started putting it together and thinking about it in depth um me and marcus and rob um we know that we wanted to do to make a sort of slightly nuanced take on what a fanfare is because the context of it has been you know is that it's coming out of this very very difficult period for so many people so it's not it's not a monochromatic fanfare if you see what i mean there's um there's a there's certainly a um, a nuance to it that I think Marcus definitely um, gets and has created in the poem um, that there is not just light but some darkness um, in both the poem and the piece. Well, and I would assume if you were if you were writing just in one shade of of dark or one shade of light, it probably wouldn't be terribly interesting for you as a composer either. Right. And um, that definitely comes out in the piece, which is, um, you know, I, I've tried, what I've really tried to do is um, kind of investigate, I would call it the, the texture of those forces. Um, so it's not, it's not so much about um, melody and, and rhythm. I mean, that, the, the piece is very fast and it has this driving, um, almost continuous uh, 16 note, 16th note pulsing throughout the piece. So there's, there's, a, there's certainly an excitement to the piece. Um, and uh, melodically there's, you know, there are, there are melodic lines and motifs that come in and out um but i would say the focus of the piece is 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 trying to create different textures in terms of uh permutations of voice and instrument and trying to really create a spectrum of sound so it's not just the choir accompanied by the orchestra it's very much everyone together um, creating this piece that is perpetually shifting in its depth. Um, and the way that I do that is the piece always keeps coming back to um, a middle C on the um, repeated middle Cs. And once that happens and you're repeating the same pitch and the rhythm is consistent, all you've got to play with at that point in terms of the shading is hearing that going around the orchestra and the singers and creating this sort of textural swirl. And part of that is it allows the music to get out of the way, the, allows the music to get out of the way and let the, the text shine, um, which I think is very important. Uh, so yeah, it's a sort of, 
Yeah, it's 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 about six minutes, six seven minutes long. Um, it's almost it's always moving and shimmering. I would describe it um, from beginning to end, um, and uh, it's about yeah. I would say that what what the music does is try to cast the poem with it. it and the thing about the poem is it it's a it's a poem in its own right. It people will read. The poem and take what they want away from the poem um, uh, in in their unique way that one does when you encounter a poem uh, and I think all I can do is is cast different shadows and different um, light on my re my reading of the poem and how it came and how I think it came about in the piece uh, in, in the discussions prior to writing the work. Now, was this a poem that Marcus Omari had already written, or was this written exclusively for this? And, and if so, what made him the person that was going to give language to what you wanted to address in this acknowledgement of the past two years? So the, I mean, the, 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 it's an absolutely, yeah, it's a collaboration between me and Marcus. Um, I don't know if you're getting a chance to speak with him, but I think you'd, you'd find it, I think he's like an amazing, he's an amazing um individual that I think you'd get a lot out of um speaking with him but um yeah it was a collaboration with Marcus right from the beginning so Pacific Corral commissioned me and him to create this work and um Marcus came to uh, uh my attention through Rob Eistad the um artistic director of Pacific Corral and it goes back to this idea of really wanting the piece to be about the community of the Pacific Corral. So not, you know, not just any piece of music. You know, I don't, I don't live, I don't live there. Um, so we, we definitely wanted someone that was in the Orange County community and who worked not just, I guess, as a poet, but also um, as an activist and, a, and a, an animateur and a thinker and um that is marcus you know he's he's a great communicator and um in a way that's what you want as a composer is not just someone to write the text but someone to someone that they themselves and the discussions that you have with them to inspire you you know you need the inspiration from the person as much as from the work that they do. And so we had a lot of discussions, you know, or, or we're one big discussion about, you know, everything, not just the pandemic, but everything that had happened in the pandemic period, especially, you know, to do with racial justice and readdressing these, um, huge issues uh, not just in the united states but you know globally and really we part of that was like how do you how do you talk about these huge things in a short piece without it being pandering you know without it being lecturing without it being um you know glib and we did we and and he i felt was just a really good person to talk to about how you try and create you know something uh, uh truthful and has he as he puts it how do you think about these huge topics which which are of lasting significance um yet how do you make the piece not so tied to any one issue that it speaks narrowly because ultimately the piece is about you know ultimately the piece is commissioned to get everyone creating and performing and singing again so it with a view to looking forward so it's not just about looking over the last two years it's really about looking forward so this idea of lasting significance not bound to one incident which is marcus's words by the way um was was crucial i think to our discussion and um, to making the, you know, making the piece that we did.
there's a lot to, to discuss in, in, within that given answer, but the thing I'm most curious about is that's a lot to get across in six minutes, six or seven minutes. So is it easier for you as a composer to write something that's tight and condensed like this or something longer that allows you more time to explore both with, work, with language and with music, all of these ideas? Because they are pretty big ideas. I think, yeah, I think they're very different things. And I think, I think in these large, these longer works, you know, I've written, you know, stage works, two hour stage works, or three hour stage works like operas and ballets. You know, with those types of things, you're doing a lot of thinking on behalf of the audience and the people that are taking in the, the music and, the, and the, the narrative or the story or the words. And that's one challenge. And that's a different, you know, that's a different type of challenge where you're trying to maintain narrative and dramatic pace over a long period of time. And I love that. What this is, which I love in a different way, it's a different puzzle and it's a different challenge, is you're only hinting. You know, you're not, you're, you're not thinking on behalf of anyone because there's not enough time. And also it goes right through to the beginning, beginnings of our thinking. How we don't want to be lecturing. We don't want to be pandering. We don't want to be telling people what to think about the last two years or to think about these big topics. We just want to shine a little light on the discussions and where we were. Incoming phone call, sorry. And so it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm trying to think how I would describe that in terms of how we talk about these big topics. Yeah, I think they are, I suppose it's a little bit like a, not quite a snapshot, but it's a sort of, there's a distance to it. There's a distance to these big thought, to these big topics um, where I think that distance is important because it creates a much a uh, bigger perspective. And so, yeah, it's, it's really about, I think, the feelings around these things from, from some distance now, you know, I mean, the pandemic isn't over, but obviously we're in a completely different place to where we were in March, two years ago, almost, you know, exactly. Um, we're many in a complete, would argue we're in a completely different place than we were on Monday. Right, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, with the new mandate. Um, you know, and these big, these big things that co have coincided with the pandemic, such as this attention to racial justice, is obviously not over. Many, many would say we're just at the very beginning of this journey, um, this reckoning. Um, and again, this is about... Um, to, to, there are elements of this that are about looking forward, as I said, not just looking back. So really, yeah, I suppose it's it's just um, it's almost like you've put the the needle down in the middle of a, of a of a record, and there's been a lot before, and there's a lot left on on that side of the LP, and you're just getting a little um, hint, um, and hopefully there's enough room both in the poem and in the music for people to take away their own interpretation um, of our thinking and, and where how we got to where we are in, in writing this piece. Right, now the pandemic of course left a lot of performance opportunities, you know, adrift in the inability to actually have them happen. So I know you have another work that's having a world premiere in June with Jacksonville symphony yep. called trances yep. can you give me a, a brief idea of what that's about and what it's like to be the opening act for beethoven's ninth yeah well it's terrifying um <laughs> uh, and i'm finishing it right now actually 
um, and it um, is um, in it, it's it, actually it's 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 not it's not dissimilar in a way. Um, it's the third. Th there are three pieces that I've written. Well, this is the third piece of three for orchestra that that um, sort of look to my um, North African heritage. Um, the first piece was Rye, the second one Charby, and this one Trances. And they're sort of they're sort of inspired by Moroccan and Algerian folk. Um, music and um they're not why why there's a link here is they're not these are not sort of ethnographic studies or musicological studies of that music they're really about thinking back to when i was young and um with my family in north africa and um and it's about it's about the haze of memory you know, um, all of these pieces, all three of these pieces are about the haze of memory, um, the inaccuracies of recalling things that seem so um, clear and well-defined, but by nature, uh, um, you know, the mind plays tricks. And so all three pieces cover that. And so trances is, is actually, it's very fast, another very <laughs> fast piece that gets faster and faster and faster. Um, but it's for a sm slightly smaller, well, it's actually smaller orchestra, yeah, than than uh, for the quickening. Um, and uh, it uh, there's a the, 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 the sort of percussion begins to take a, a a key role in the work as it goes through to the end. Um, but yeah, it's odd that both pieces are being paired with these uh, epic. Works the Bon Williams and the the Beethoven. I was, I, I mean, I try, I try not to think about it too much, but I do feel like you know, if other other arts artists in other forms don't necessarily get this treatment. I mean, I always I think if you're if you're if you're a visual artist and you're you're showing your new painting, and it's in the same opening as um you know, there's your painting and next to it there's a Picasso or something or a Jackson Pollock or what have you. Um, so it does feel a bit like that, but I just try not to not to think about it. Well, it it could be worse, and this is a different genre of music. But early in the '70s, Judy Collins had a show in New York, and her opening act was Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> so you can imagine how that turned out. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so earlier this year, the Washington Post named you as one of the 22, you know, composers to, you know, pay attention to in 2022. Um, and they referenced a new opera. And knowing that, knowing that Joseph Conrad was an inspiration at one point, I'm wondering what other light, happy-go-lucky, easy reading fare you've chosen for this next opera. Oh, I can't, I wish I could tell you. I'm not allowed, to, I'm afraid, I'm not allowed to tell you anything about it other than, um, what can I say? It's it's based on a novel of a very well known living author, um, and uh, where yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can say. Um, and it's um, for period instruments, so it's going to be for Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra, and it's about uh, taking. Um, you know, a contemporary novel um, and placing it in the context of these um, historically informed instruments and performers and creating, you know, an interesting space um, for new work. And it's part of a much bigger scheme of, of my role there as a composer in residence there is, is, is to commission um, much more work for uh, historically informed instruments and uh, 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 singers. So, so uh, my plan is um, hopefully next year we'll be announcing the commissioning scheme um, and really to, to uh, just start getting um, lots of exciting new 
pieces by exciting composers uh, written for these um, uh, instruments and players that are so, they're so, I mean, they're just amazing players um, who, you know, the bulk of their repertoire is, is old. Um, and I think, and I think there's a hunger for applying their immense skill and way of thinking about um, music and performance, um, applying it to contemporary work. So that's, that's very exciting to me. Well, that should also allow for a really interesting conversation between the past and the present by virtue of that combination. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, I think what's interesting about the historically informed way of doing things is it's, it's, it's undergone, you know, so many um, different iterations from its early stages, you know, um, 60, 70 years ago, where it was in a discovery phase, you know, discovering all this music um, uh, that really wasn't very popular uh, through to the, you know, once, once you sort of start hitting this 70s and 80s, it, it, it becomes very much about authenticity, you know, how, do, how was it done? And I think the whole movement got maybe a bit tied up in itself around that, obsessing over how many notes in a trill <laughs> in the 17th century or whatever. Um, but, but the thing that interests me as a composer is what I would call the sort of historically informed attitude, which is, if you want to know, and this is what interests me about writing for these players, if you want to know what it was like in the audience or as, a, or as someone coming to hear a new work of Handel or Bach or what that felt like, um, you would have been around a huge amount of new music. There, was, there, was new, there were premieres all the time. And a lot of it just, you know, disappeared. But if you want to really feel what it was like to be around these performances, you need to have premieres. That's a much more historically informed way of encountering Bach or Handel or Purcell or whatever, is that there should always be new work around it because, you know, the percentage of new or contemporaneous works in the average 17th century concert was far, far, far exponentially greater um, than it is today. You know, every single concert pretty much either had a premiere or something written in the last few years. I mean, that's that's what it was like. And I think there's a lot that contemporary living composers can do um, to sort of get back to that way of thinking uh, and to encounter these works um, in the context of new works. I think, you know, I think it's very important. Um, well, but, and, and I just love, I just love what, uh, Richard Egar, who's the music director of Philharmonia Baroque, you know, thinks in exactly the same way. Um, it's 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 not just about the technic technical technical aspects or technicalities of how things were done, but it's very much about the attitude and getting a bit of that excitement. You know, when everything was new, you know, all all these pieces that we love were premiered once. What did that feel like? You know, that's very I love that. You know, I think it's so important. Well, and we could we could go down a lengthy path to discuss how it's not just the composers that have to take that on, but it's the institutions that have to be comfortable with programming that way. But I, we'll save that conversation for another time. Well, and it's it, and it links uh, Pacific Choral with Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra. These are these are organizations that are commissioning and. Um, uh, reprogramming new works, which is the other thing. The world does yam. You know, you don't you don't just premiere a piece, but you try and give more. You know, over time, you try and give more than one performances. But yeah, these are. I'm very very lucky to have been associated with Pacific Corral and now PBO. Uh, these are forward thinking organisations that you're absolutely right have taken on the um, for you know the risk and the foresight of. Um, being excited about about creating new work so that so that again we go back to where we began so that it's about looking forward not just looking back right well and speaking of uh ending where we began i'm going to end with a quote by ray fawn williams for you to respond to uh -oh. um, 
He said, the art of music above all other arts is the expression of the soul of a nation. Do you agree with him? And what would you like your music to say that, about the soul of perhaps not just one nation, but ultimately all of us as humans? Um, yeah, I... <laughs> well, William, yeah. So I, I get where he's coming from with that quote. And, you know, that's what, as I said, I've, I've definitely had a... a an understanding or a reckoning where he's, if you again, you take it in that context, he's trying to create some kind of audible national identity born of Britishness. Um, do I fundamentally agree with that? No, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think personally music um, embodies the soul of a nation. Um, and there's certainly this legacy, there's certainly a sort of 19th century legacy of um, music being the art of all art. Um, and funnily enough, I think that has been potentially quite damaging over the years where, where you know, especially in the, I especially in the like, from, from the middle of the 19th century to the 20th century, the idea of the composer being you know, a sort of genius figure and um, untouchable in a way. Um, so I feel I feel very different to that. And I feel, I, partly I, I feel different to that because I feel something rather nice has happened to composing, which is it's got, it's got, it's gone back to being a craft. And I think the great thing about being, a, the great thing about a craft is that, it, is that linked much further back to sort of earlier music, I think Bach, um, very much a craftsperson linking in improvisation with performing, with composing, and, and uh, composing being brought much more in line with greater music making and communication. Um, so for me, um, the thing that I find the thing that I find most powerful about music and what I enjoy as a composer is that something magical happens between the page and the ear um, that is mostly to do, but not entirely to do uh, with the people performing the work. And that's why it's so important to have two or three performances because nothing changes on the page with the second performance or the third performance or the fourth performance. Um, but something is changing in the ether, something is changing in the performances. And I think what I feel as a composer is in a way, a bit like being a, like an architect or suppose, I, all I can do is create the, the blueprints um, for this living art form that is temporal. It takes time to encounter, um, to breathe. And I'm reliant on these wonderful performers um, to build, you know, to build the work from the blueprints. But, but, yeah, I mean, I feel that, you know, the soul, you know, in terms of the soul of, of where I feel it, it is, 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 is honestly, is all, all I, I feel like all I can do is like, like the touch paper. That's really how I feel, and that there's. There's a lot of magic in music that I am not in control of, but that I I love being a part of and maybe just, you know, triggering it and then sitting back and 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 watching and, and listening. And I find that very, very rewarding. And that's why I love working with people like Rob and the Pacific Corrupt. They they go with it. They 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 are not beholden to my intent every you know, every tiny thing. They're aware that, that music is a living art form. So that's, I suppose that's my greatest um, sense of where there is a soul is that it, it's, it's alive.